part two. Welcome back. Somebody must have watched the first one if we're doing a second one. There's just so much that we talked about, but we didn't even scratch the surface. So today, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another tweener head tennis video today here on the channel. Today, for our part two of 2023 tennis gear review, we have the one and only Tim. And he's, if you guys don't know who Tim is, go get to know Tim on Twitter. Go get to know him on Forbes. Go get to know him on every platform ever. Check out his Instagram. This this guy's in in the thick of it when it comes to debuting gear and talking to the pros about their new gear as well. So, Tim, welcome back for part two. Total of number yeah. three appearances here on the Tweener Head Tennis Channel. Yeah, does that make me a regular yet? Yes, it does. It definitely does. <laughs> Tim is a regular now, and I love it. But last time you came on, we talked a lot about on New Balance – a bit of Nike, but we didn't even, and that was all shoes and somewhat clothing for them. Today, we're going to talk about the non-traditional brands, the brands that we overlooked a little bit and some of the gear that came out this past year. And there's so much that we can talk about, but I think the one that everyone will mainly know that we can start with is Wilson. Wilson, from their insane amount of rackets that they've been pushing the new main sponsor for Marta Kostyuk, a Ukrainian player that was kind of the front runner for the Wilson line for women and even men for that matter. But Tim, what can you tell us about Wilson in 2023? First off, I love what Wilson is doing. They are, they're going all in on tennis and any brand that's going all in on tennis, we've got to be a fan of. Mm -hmm. Wilson, you know, in a, in a world, especially when you get into the rackets, you know, in a world that is very global, mm -hmm. you know, Wilson gives you that, you know, that kind of that USA, you know, based in Chicago, all that kind of stuff, that heritage that, that everybody should know, if you don't know, you know, that I think is fun for me too to, to see that play out them doing the head to toe with Marta though, that, that was that was impressive because now you have a brand that that has to be serious about more than just rackets. They have to step up the footwear game. They have to step up the apparel game. And they really did. I mean, their their Wilson sportswear line is is growing. It's you know, it's not just tennis. Obviously, they, they oh, yeah. cover a, a range of sports, but, mm -hmm. you know, they have some tennis specific capsules in there. And and you saw it at the U.S. Open especially. And so all in all, I, I love what what Wilson is doing in tennis and they're a brand too i think when players back in the early 2000s too or maybe in the late 90s but in the early 2000s too or when i was growing up playing tennis you would see players that didn't have a main clothing sponsorship they would have wilson send them clothes but it was be more of training gear that they would send to brand ambassadors or coaches that weren't showing off on tour it was just mainly the rackets that they wanted them to promote as well as maybe their shoe line, but now we're getting more specific and more designed ath athlete designed clothing again with Marta, but we don't have a male player yet. Is there I, actually no? for a while it was Ugo Humbert who was sporting Wilson altogether. Um, throwback to Brazilian Bellucci was another all Wilson wear as well. Um, and a lot of others, but who do you, for male players, do you think that's their next step to get that primary player? Because they have Marta who is top 50 so far. That's been pretty consistent top 100 at least. And she's been repping the brand as well as her famous neon yellow dress that she's kind of been known around tour because it's kind of sparked a controversy. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, I, she definitely uh, is known for that dress. She even just posted recently again about how much she loves that dress. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that Wilson needs to grab another athlete right now. As, okay. You know, marketing dollars the way they are, you know, if, if you're getting that much attention from one player, then you're going to be doing fine. Obviously, that's not going to last forever or, mm -hmm. or maybe it will. But, you know, so, yeah, maybe down the road we'll see them add another player and a, a male player would probably be the way to go there. But 
you know, like you said, even with the the female specific clothing line, it's bringing attention here to guys, two males talking about Wilson clothing. So we don't need a male athlete to show us that Wilson has clothes for men. We know yeah. they do. And then we see the the women's line. We're like, oh, that's cool. And maybe you go on Wilson, you know, on their website and you see the other stuff or you start following them on your socials and you see that they have the women's and the men's stuff. So I don't know that it's imperative that they get a male, you know, locked in mm -hmm. this off season um, because we're noticing them already. We are. We are. And in terms of their shoes, too, they've been doing some great stuff with their technology. And one thing that I've always noticed or I've noticed in the last two years with now the French Open Roland Garros being switched to their main sponsor with Wilson and the French brand Babylon is now Wimbledon. Yeah. What do you. They've always had kind of a custom Wilson French inspired shoe. What can you tell us about that one? You know, I think it's fun to see, and I use that phrase a lot, fun, right? You know, yeah. it's, it's fun to see a brand that does something that is, I mean, yeah, they're trying to make money, but it's for the fans. And so Wilson being the the primary, you know, shoe sponsor for the, for Roland Garros and then the equipment sponsor for, for US Open, I think what we get with that is limited edition stuff. Yeah. And we even saw it with Labor Cup recently in vancouver that's you know, true. when wilson gets a sponsorship they lean into it and that's that's unique for the fan because if you enjoy uh whether it be a brand or a tournament it gives you an other avenue so with the shoe the last couple of years they've done a kind of a graffiti inspired uh design on their on their rush line for men and women and they've done two colors each for roland garros and then yeah. two colors each for us open yeah and they're also doing you know, specific designs of bags and rackets for each yeah. tournament. You know, the, the U S open version, was it, you know, not this one, this one was kind of a duller blue and white the year before they went with the night session, went kind of all black with all black, stuff, which I thought was awesome year before that. I'm kind of a map guy. I like maps not to nerd out, but they did the New York city map on the racket frames. That's one of my favorite rackets yeah. that I own is that U S open limited edition. And then the French open stuff, you know, the, the roll on Garrow stuff is just it's really classic. Classy, yeah. You know, and, and it's really cool. And then, you know, just to go on that, they don't stop with just those two. Like I have the, in the corner there, you know, you can't see it. It's the all black. It's the, you know, the blackout, the blackout stuff that they're doing right now across a bunch of lines mm -hmm. and and whatnot so wilson they have their mainline stuff they're they're already kind of pushing the envelope in colors and paints mm -hmm. and stuff on frames but then to do these special editions yeah not everybody's gonna go spend another 250 bucks or whatever it is on a racket but some of those people <laughs> will right yeah and so that's they're they're making limited editions exactly. for that reason for us that like to collect maybe a certain a certain line or yeah. if we're you know, we're big U.S. Open fans. You go every year, you get the new racket every year just for your mm -hmm. collection, that kind of stuff. I think it's it's really unique opportunity that the sport doesn't give us a lot. I, I agree. And to kind of go along the lines of your map nerding out the picture of what what cities behind you right now? Yeah, that's Portland, Oregon. So that's where um, I don't I don't live there now, but born and raised <laughs> Portland. So okay. there's, there's the map behind the me. map, the map, the grid, the grid of Portland, <laughs> Oregon. So not good touch there. I like that. And the last part about Wilson for me too, I would say is for their, they've always been a marketing. They've always been ahead in marketing when it comes to other brands, when it comes to getting creative, I know, especially for their juniors, they did their minions line. They yeah. did a whole thing with Nishikori with the minions so they they've been marketing a lot more than other brands when it comes to advertising for certain demographics. And even with their triad, um, triad X5 or X3 with the older generation, they never really had to market to them because they know how good it plays for those types of players. So for Wilson to really push now for pro athletes to be in their gear is a huge stepping stone for what we're going to see in 2024. So for one more, one more thing on Wilson, before you, you move on to talk about the marketing thing, 
I threw one back here, but what they did with the shift and oh, that's right. You know, how they, they, they introduced that as a prototype and, and whether you like that or not, it's unique and it's different. And there's now, you know, shift prototypes out there that you can't buy anymore. Yep. You can obviously buy the version one. I think they're up to three different models now too, with yep. the weight, you know, three different weights, basically That's true. In that line. And so they, they came up with a whole new way to introduce a racket line. Yeah. And it was interesting and it was, it was marketing focused and, and consumer focused. And now we have a whole nother, you know, main line, yeah. you know, kind of along the lines of the clash where they're maybe not seeing it on the pro tour, but it's still going to be super popular yeah. for, for players. So, yeah. you know, that's a great point you make about the marketing and we even just saw it with, with how they dealt with the shift. Well, actually one more thing about the shift too, with they, they put it out. They had people play test it. They had their brand ambassador yeah. play testing it, but then they sent it back. And from what I've heard, they basically listened to what people were saying, their brand ambassadors and changed it before they mass produced it for the public and not just the brand ambassadors that were doing it. They changed right. the way they changed the different dynamics about it. Which in tennis, I've never heard of a brand doing something like that where they said, okay, it's not it's not like they got bullied into doing it, but they listened to what they did and said, okay, how fast can we put this out while making these changes? Right. So they they came out with the prototype and they wanted mm -hmm. to get it in hand. So they obviously mm -hmm. sent to to you know some influencers or whatnot, but then they made it for sale and you could buy the prototype version on a limited yep. edition release. They put a QR code right on the side of the racket. And you could go in and give your feedback. And yeah, before, you know, this Wilson, you know, Wilson Labs shift with kind of the, yeah. you know, probably type, type marketing, you know, goes there. And then you turn into, you know, the new cosmetics and the brand whole new, new cosmetic not, changed. And it's not just the cosmetic. I mean, they're pretty similar, right? You got the same blue ice and whatnot, but, you know, a little bit different look in, in, in how it's, they, it, but, but it's to cleaner. your point, they changed the, the weighting of it yeah. and they changed the balance point and, and some of the very technical specs based yeah. on the feedback that they, I mean, they basically crowdsourced feedback to speed up the development process of an entirely Crazy. new line of rackets. That's That's unbelievable. So, well, shout out, shout out Wilson for doing that. If you want to yeah, yeah. shout out Wilson for just listening to consumers. I, I, I just appreciate it. I think that's one of the best. I think that's one of the best, or most well handled situation you can ask from a brand. Yeah. Um, if you want to send us stuff, Wilson, please just let us know. Just he has the shifts. I don't. I'm just saying that. <laughs> I, I'm just saying that. Um, moving on to different brands as well. One one word you used, or kind of two word phrase that you used for some of the brands that we saw come into tennis this year the non-traditional tennis brands and the three that we mentioned. And I don't even think we mentioned this last time, Viore, free people and Lululemon non-tennis specific brands that are now inside the tennis world. And actually, can we throw penguin in there? Original penguin in that conversation as well, because yeah. I feel like that's golf full brand, yeah. golf brand right there. So especially on the women's side, we saw a lot of women move to free people. I know so uh, Sonia Kennan mm -hmm. did it. Uh, Sloan Stevens did it. And a couple others have done it, but not as high profile names, like two people that won a grand slam. Mm -hmm. So what can you tell us about uh, free people to start with? Well, I think you can kind of, you know, they're not going to want to get clumped together, but you can clump yes. some of the brands together in the same category. And I've written about each one and their different move in, but it basically is the same thing is we have a consumer set that plays tennis. So let's make gear that fits them. And then at the same time, well, let's attract new consumers by going to a sport that's very popular right now from a recreational participation point of view and mm -hmm. create clothing that works for that. And, you know, credit Lululemon really for the first one to, yeah. to do, this. you know, they had men's clothing for a few years 
Yeah. That was, I don't know if it was tennis specific, but it was used on the tennis it circuit. Was, it was the first, F, I would say the first athleisure brand to break the market yes. and bring not just women's clothing, but men's athletic clothing that was used yeah. all the time. And they really started with the men's, which is, which is interesting. And, and I'm a, you know, I, I live near Vancouver, so there's Lululemon all around us and, you know, <laughs> it's, it's quality stuff for, you know, to, to play in, to work out in all that kind of stuff. But when they brought in Layla Fernandez, they really kind of upped that focus on tennis. And then quickly thereafter, you get the free people with Kenan and then eventually Sloan and others. And I think if you go on their websites and you look at some of their, their stuff, some of the stuff is very tennis specific, especially for the females with some mm -hmm. of the dresses and skirts. And some of the some of the items are maybe, you know, it's listed in a tennis collection, but I don't know how tennis specific it is. But at the same time, when a brand is putting money into the sport by sponsoring yeah. players, mm -hmm. it it gives consumers another option. And hopefully they grow their their tennis know how so that they're building products that are better suited for the court, for mm -hmm. players, for us as consumers that want to go buy something. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it gives players, I mean, we've talked before, it's it's super annoying to watch a tennis match and they're both wearing the same exact kit across from each other. And the players talk about this. You know, Sloan told me that she now she loves that she doesn't have to worry about any other player wearing the kit that she's wearing. Yeah. Like that's, you know, she's wearing the only one, Layla Fernandez's kit is incredibly unique each tournament and so you know you get a different aesthetic on the court you bring in more brands that give more consumers choices it gives more athletes choices you know they don't have to just go with the big brands if their contracts are not what they could get with some of these smaller brands mm -hmm. a brand like lululemon's obviously doing just fine yeah same with free people they can afford one or two or a few big big name players and give us some some choices some options and give the and have that publicity from those names as well and some of the other athletes that i've noticed wearing lululemon a lot of australians have been wearing lululemon as well you have daria seville uh former daria gavrilova before she got married to luke seville and then um alex bolt as well former top 100 player and then Viore as well has been sent to a lot of the college athletes or just graduated college athletes. And they've been, they're on the newer side compared to some of the other non-traditional brands. Same with Penguin, at least in the world of tennis. But Viore is really targeting that younger demographic. I know Elliot Spaziri wore some during the U.S. Open. I know Marcus Giron is now fully sponsored yep. by Viore, which is another player that just beat Casper Ruud as the time we were recording this another guy that's promoting the brand on a bigger stage. So those non-traditional brands are really standing out because people are curious as to why they're not wearing a Nike Adidas, Diodora. And, and how what, many people whatever. have searched, you know, player name clothing to see what it is. Exactly. You know, especially some brands, Lululemon, Viore, you know, and even free people, their logos aren't, they don't splash their logos. All no, over. it's very so simple. You, it is subtle and simple and something that maybe a consumer would be more likely to wear because, you know, it's not, they don't want to board exactly type thing. And so I think it's interesting. You, you know, with both Viore and Lululemon, they, they, you know, considered probably female brands. They both started in men's tennis, you know, with, yeah. with, you know, so I think it's, it's interesting to see. It's not just, you know, for, for one, you know, for a tennis skirt or something, Mm -hmm. You know, they're developing product that that can go across a long range. I, I totally agree. And kind of, I actually wanted to ask you this, and I forgot to mention this before we started recording. The deal that Isla Tomlanovich has, she's with Original Penguin right now, but she's invested in a sporting company that I'm not entirely sure about, but you may be able to help me with the details on it. Do you know what I'm talking about with her? Um, are you talking about the weighted vest? Yes. Yeah. So uh, how does how does a player like that who's invested in a company that makes sport training clothing slash equipment and so and wearing a different brand on the court? 
Yeah, I mean, every everything is contractually set out. So okay, you know, there's going to be players that have just an on court contract, yeah. and they can pretty much they can wear what they want when they're mm -hmm. not on the court because you know if you have a contract with athletic brand a well yeah. they don't make um you know clothing you would go to you know a fancy dinner in yes. so they're not required to wear that 24 7 now yes. if you're roger Federer, maybe you are in uniqlo you know forever well that's well when because you're paying 300 million dollars well and that would be in the contract right yeah. and so there's times that you'll see athletes it's kind of it, sometimes it's written and sometimes it's unwritten you know just because you're wearing this brand doesn't mean you get to wear jordans when you're yeah. out in pub you know like that's kind of taboo stuff so you know to go back to your isla question is she's going to have a an on-court performance contract with original penguin so when mm -hmm. she is competing and and you know on in a tournament she's wearing their gear mm -hmm. but she's also going to have this deal with uh i believe it's a morpho i'm gonna yes. mess that um okay a morpho. um you know so where she's gonna wear that stuff training and that's more of an equipment contract it's just like somebody who has a a new balance apparel footwear deal and a wilson racket deal they're yes. not wearing wilson clothing yes they're wearing new balance clothing but they're gotcha. still using a wilson racket so that's okay. the same kind of thing it's there's a there's a distinction between clothing or apparel footwear you know the hats would be in with that versus the equipment which is going to be rackets and and other things like that whether it's like a, a theragun or yeah. any of those types of things it just opens up an, another avenue for for a player to to get some revenue well and this may be me not understanding contracts or how the business side of the tennis world works but when you have players say wearing a brand like on to me is very interesting because or having a player that wears new balance when they go out they can wear designer brand stuff because it's not a not performance a brand. not a competitive brand but say yeah. a player is sponsored by the first name that comes to mind is new balance and they go out and they're seen wearing jordans but they're not wearing any new balance right so How how would that work or how would that conflict with their contract? Yeah, that's going to conflict with a contract because they're going to be a competitor clause in there. So, okay. you know, they wear a designer brand, you know, luxury brands and, and fashion brands, so to speak, because they're not a competitor, you know, a new balance is not going to want their athletes wearing any direct competitors, which are obviously going to be spelled out as your Nikes and Asics and Adidas and all, and you know, all those, you're not going to see them in that, but you can see them in a fashion brand because like I said before, it's not like New Balance is making, you know, high end stuff that you'd wear to a gala event or something of that nature. Now they may still decide to really rock some New Balance kicks mm -hmm. at, you know, with a suit or whatnot, yeah. but but, uh, you know, that would be their own choice and, and something that they don't have to do mm -hmm. as long as they're not choosing to go Jordans or something of that nature. Well, it's funny because I, when you when you say Nike or Adidas, Jordan is its own separate entity now. It's not even under Nike's it's not under Nike's umbrella, but it's but it's its own entity where it's not involved in the world of tennis, if that makes sense. So yeah, when, but it's still owned by Nike. It's so, still owned by Nike. Yeah, so Nike owns Adidas and Con. Or excuse me, Nike Whoa. owns. Yeah, that's not breaking news. Just obviously a major slip up. So Nike owns Jordan and Converse. So they run as separate entities. Like the the departments at Jordan, you know, are making their own decisions on what athletes they're signing and things of that nature. But they're still owned by Nike, so that, you know they're sharing technology at times. Okay. You know, there's, 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 they're still part of the same. They're still company. okay, and that parent company of Nike with everything underneath. Okay, that yeah. that makes more sense. Yeah. For another brand, not a non-traditional brand, but one that had a huge campaign uh, this past year was Hugo Boss, and yeah. for a guy with 
Matteo Berrettini being that new front runner switching. Did he switch immediately from Lodo to Hugo Boss? He switched to Boss, I believe, in 2022. So it was a big, um, it's a big shift, big shift for him, and it was a good get for him. And and really, you know, they he's be they've used him a lot, even in 2023 when he hasn't been super healthy um, and super as prominent. He's you know, you know, I've I've talked to some other people about it, and obviously, Matteo Berrettini, no matter if he's winning tournaments or not. He's he going to be a brand. Has, he still has a, a a model, a fashion model look to him. So, um, and if you look, if you go on the boss site and he's look at the it. athletes that they sponsor, you see Barantini, but he's on par with. I mean, they're not necessarily looking for the number one player in each sport. There, there's a there's a fashion model sense to to a lot of the athletes that they have on on their brand. But again, I agree. talking about a non-traditional tennis brand, having tennis collections, Boss is it. And, and Hugo Boss, just for those that don't know, they've kind of marketed themselves separate. It's a Hugo Boss is the company. They're kind of trying to push the Hugo as the luxury side and, and the, the boss. boss as the athletic side. Mm-hmm. Um, so, if you, you know, they're doing that a little bit. So that's why okay. I guarantee a lot of his stuff just says Boss on it. And But, you know, in 2023, I thought it was really interesting to see that the boss and asics collaborated on 100%. on that shoe that he you know that he wore in 2023 so that was interesting to see he's definitely been a huge part of collections and they mm-hmm. have entire tennis capsule collections that he's the face of but you know they have you know everything from sweatshirts to polos to to tees and shorts etc yeah I, I that that collaboration to me i think we talked a little bit about it last time you were on the channel but when you have a a fashion brand like Hugo Boss combining with Asics, would this is again maybe a stupid question, but would they be able to sell the Hugo Boss Asics shoes on the Hugo Boss site, or because it's primarily from Asics, you would have to buy it directly from Asics? Generally, you know, when you do a collaboration, it's a collaboration, so you're going to sell them at both places. Okay. So not always the case, but definitely is the norm. Um, There will be times where for marketing reasons, it's only available on one of the sites mm -hmm. instead of the other, but generally, you know, you're going to be able to get it. So, so has that ever happened before with a fashion and shoe brand? Because in the sport of tennis? Yes. Well, I mean, other than uh, the Gucci tennis shoe, um, I don't know if you're talking, you know, collab or not. As far as collabs go, I'm not aware of a fashion brand collaborating with an athletic brand for a tennis court specific shoe. So yeah. that to me was what was really special about that shoe, whether or not you liked the design or the colors or I like or the colors. The colors look good. Well, and that's the other thing is it's something completely different. When you get a perspective from a from a brand like Hugo Boss you're going to get a different perspective mm-hmm. than, than what you're getting from some of the other brands. So anytime, and that's the same thing we go back with, with the Lululemon, Viore, Free People, Original Penguin, you're getting new and different perspectives and it just creates more options for consumers. And it also hopefully invites more brands into the sport because they see others having success. I mean, Yannick Sinner, you know, made a few waves with, with the I, bag that he brought out. I freaking wait. love it. I freaking love it. That's that to me too. It's not how many hoops did he have to jump through to get that approved? I have no idea how that thing got approved with how strict they are. On really? Everything. I, you know, I, I, I haven't talked to anybody in the process of it because um, it's been so, you know, far past in the past, but, uh, you know, part of me wants to look into that a little bit more because I mean, curious was getting in trouble for wearing a red know, hat red Jordan hat and the red Jordans. And here we have center with a, with a bag that, yeah, it's white, but it's it might as well be green. Yeah. It, it, because it's, that's just a different, that's just a different conversation when it comes to comparing <laughs> athletes and what they do. But 
if you really think about it though it's in the, it, yeah in there they did get it cleared before they did it and that's why it was able to go is because they did jump through the hoops and they tried to go about it you know what they the, felt was the, the proper right way and obviously what wimbledon felt was the right way to do it but in the end to go back to the conversation fashion brands are again you know there was a time when tennis and fashion brands were very synonymous they are again becoming more synonymous whether it be mm-hmm. center or Barantini or even Alcaraz with with his deals. Yeah. So maybe we'll see more um Louis Vuitton and, on the court with um Gucci on the court, Hugo Boss more more style. It'll be hard because all these athletes have sponsors already, right? So it's not like, you know, you're going to well, see Sinner just start wearing Louis Vuitton on the court. His contract with with Nike would have to expire and, you know, Louis Vuitton would have to decide that they're going to, you know, so Alcaraz some, would, Alcaraz would yeah. do Louis Vuitton, Gucci would do center. If, if they, you know, yeah, excuse me. So if they could, you know, if they decided that that's what they wanted to spend their money on yeah. when the contracts expire, there's a lot of things that would have to happen to make that work, which is why the boss a six collab was so unique is that, you know, that's like you said, probably haven't ever seen that before hopefully we see it again yeah i agree and and to me too when you see that gets me excited not just as a tennis fan but as 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 a sports fan too when you see all these people try something different or at least try to stand out it's kind of like in in american sports where you have all these players walk uh, you have walkthroughs like you have you see them make a statement before the game or you have a a talking point before each one and you have people talking about it before the game or match starts so when you kind of and going back to female athletes and male athletes wearing the same kits it takes away the individuality of each player because one you don't know which one's which and two it's not providing something that people can look at and go, okay, let me look that up. Okay. How do I get this? Okay. Is it accessible? Let me read more about this player. So it it takes away from that. Yeah. I think one area we're starting to see that come into play, even just a little bit is in the on court interview post-match. Yeah. You know, walking out, Curios is the only one that walks out in something other than he plays in. Yep. I've asked a number of players if they'll ever walk out in something. And everyone's response was basically, I don't have time to change into my shoes because we only have the five minute warm up. So Kyrgios walks out in Jordan, switches into his Nikes to play. Nobody else does it. But even at US Open, and we talked about this, you know, last time I was on with Alcaraz switching into the Mac attacks and things like that, you know, and obviously much has been made about, you know, jackets, you know, after wins and stuff there's an opportunity there for for a little bit of of wiggle room and hopefully we see more of that it only took people after curios to kind of do that too because it, it's funny they always assume that curios will do it and not defending the guy but he started something or at least transitioned the style towards tennis a little bit differently and now that they're marketing alcaraz and nike and now that they're doing stuff, people are starting to take notice when it when in reality it was done before. So it it's funny to see how each of those work and kind of staying along that line of collabs. Prince. Yeah. The king of collabs right now. No offense. How are they still around? You know, it all goes back to authentic brand group. Did okay. I even say that right? authentic brands group. There's a there's a plural there. Um, <laughs> ABG. They they bought Prince, you know, a few years back and basically revived the brand and really focused on the off court stuff. They still have the on court stuff that's going. So they're kind of two sides to the brand now. Um, ABG is the same company that you may recall now owns Reebok. Has brought you know, Shaq back into the mix there. So we got that fun. I mean, we talked about it last time that fun um, Shaq Reebok tennis shoe. Um, ABG is a is a company that has the licensing rights to tons of athletes, celebrities, brands. Okay. Shaquille O'Neal being one of them. And if Allen Iverson is another Allen one Iverson, too that they, they hired. Have, 
uh, yes. for Reebok too, kind of going along that basketball. They just signed uh, Angel Reese from LSU to an NIL deal. Right. So, yeah, I mean, if we're going to Reebok, you know, they're they're getting back into performance sports with, yeah. with basketball. We'll see football. They just signed some some football athletes too. Hopefully tennis is, is down the road, but right now the basketball is going to be the focus, but with Prince, you know, as far as the, the performance, I mean, you, you can get the rackets on tennis warehouse, you can get the the gear at Dick's right. And, yeah. and then, you know, Groupman still does all these collabs oh, as yeah. their creative director, you know, so he's, I mean, there's a lot, they've done quite a few, um, some of them are recurring, you know, some of them are with rackets. I, I believe, uh, they've done at least two with hydrogen. They've done a, a reigning champ, couple different collabs with reigning champ. Reigning champ the- just came out too, right? Or was that earlier this year? That was earlier. Well, they've done a couple with them. So they had a new one that just came out and then they had one previous that had a racket as well. So, you know, collabs are a big thing to kind of keep the, the brand in the, the lifestyle mix as far as, on court now that Isner's retired, um, I'm not <laughs> sure we have an athlete using Prince rackets on court. But you know they're, there are they're none. Push. I mean the the new shoes that they just came out with are actually pretty good, and and you know it really kind of replaces some stuff that had been around for a while. So I they're still there because ABG is a big corporation that is really leaning into the nostalgia of the brand yeah and the the kind of history of the brand but at the same time trying to kind of push some new things well sorry i'm making this face because the they just did a collab with happy dad a brand made by youtubers from oh my god uh nelk I don't know if you're familiar with their antics. That's okay. But it's not my world. That's okay. It's a hard seltzer that they just did a collab with, which is f- for the younger generation. What they've done too is kind of, they did pranks. They did stuff like that, but that's he- nor here nor there. But it, I'm shocked by that collab because you know, the, it's the nostalgia. I agree. It's the nostalgia of the brand and the look that it provides to the other brands that it works with. Yeah. I mean, if you look at some of the, the brands that Prince has done collabs with, especially with just apparel, I mean, you have, you know, brain dead hydrogen, the one you just mentioned, there's quite a, and then there's a whole bunch of them where it's like, that's not a natural fit necessarily. Um, But you know, they're just trying to keep it alive and keep it, um i guess relevant yeah in in the world you know it's not always uh everybody's cup of tea but that's what a collab is i mean the whole purpose of a collaboration is to take two worlds that don't usually meet and put them together so that this brand gets attention from this world and this brand gets attention from this world i mean that's the whole reason a collab started and and so that's you know prince is showing us they're going to keep going on those pretty heavily I'm shocked. I I'm shocked by that, to be honest. And in for, but what would it take for Prince to get back into tennis on a bigger scale? Because I feel a lot of money. It would take a lot of money. That's that's well, just I mean, the sole answer. Because I feel like Prince, with all these collab, for me seeing all these collabs, and I'm going to be brutally honest here with the brand, seeing Prince kind of clinging on to other brands to kind of make them popular again and that's just me seeing it from an outside perspective but seeing them kind of grab onto other brands to kind of help them provide value to their name and keep it going just seems like they don't have something themselves to bring in more money they have to have something else to help them bring it in especially but now they have the shoes that that um the shoes that just came out that are replacing the Prince T 22s, which is probably one of the most iconic shoes that tennis has seen. At least they're replacing those and they actually don't look that bad. Maybe that's a start, but having others kind of do the work for you to help you for me, that doesn't, that doesn't seem like a brand that's on its own legs. Yeah. I mean, I think you're not, 
you're 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 not far off there i mean the venom okay. shoe is what we're talking about it's mm-hmm. it's a decent shoe to get into the pro game is not just i mean it depends if we're talking apparel or if we're talking equipment so okay you know like we've seen with the apparel well lululemon viori what we already talked about they can just come in and buy a player or two mm-hmm. you know on a contract prince yeah. could do that if they wanted with apparel but they're not a brand that's trying to push like if you think about lululemon they're trying to to bring more awareness to the vast array of apparel options they have. Yeah. I mean, you can go on the women's site and get lost for days. They have so many options for you. Very well, exciting that's website. <laughs> that's not what Prince is trying to do. No. So if they're trying to sell more actual pieces of equipment, tennis rackets, first off, they're probably going to have to branch out beyond just tennis warehouse. But second, for these tennis brands, these racket makers, it doesn't start, you don't just go in and get a pro player, sign them, and then it starts from the top. You have to go in grassroots and get young players, get club players playing your frames and and also having a pro or two to give it a little bit of validity. So it it's a it's kind of a more of a long game and more of a, a money game. And yeah. you know, that's that's not what the model is that we've seen from from print so far not saying their rackets aren't good because if you've played with some of those frames they're actually not bad they're not bad you know? like prince had some of the best rackets in the early 2000s granted with the ones that had the weird holes and never really had grommets the what was it the 03 yeah i think uh, so um terrible to string by the way do not recommend yeah. anyone trying to string that it, it'll give you anxiety the entire time but they had what like well-known rackets that every every junior or high level player was using but then it faded and then they didn't produce anything that was worthwhile for any other player because then it right, became yeah. just isner and then pui yeah. well, and they, then pui they were dropped. out of the game they were out of the game for a little while there and then they got revived mm-hmm. and so you know, there's just it's it's kind of a, a big financial play. But I mean, really, that that tour series they have is is a good quality series that, you know, is right up there with some of the the top racket makers. So they still have some know how, but they don't have the heft behind them of a full a full program, so to yeah. speak. I, I agree. And, and for me, too, it's. I'm happy with some of the collabs that they're doing, but I'm also one that needs to see more from them, at least from a, like you said, a validity standpoint with others. And another brand that we haven't mentioned at all, even before recording with Diadem Mm -hmm. is another brand. And I don't know how familiar you are with them, but that's another brand that's kind of been in the weeds but has been slowly growing and now they have a partnership with universal tennis they have a couple athletes now uh, on tour but not of the 250 and above range i know one player sasha vickery is sponsored by them and they're starting kind of like the selenko route they're sponsoring colleges around the nation Mm -hmm. so what what can you tell us about them from a brand standpoint i think uh i think at this point you might have uh, kind of summed it up pretty well and and that i think even goes back to what we were talking about with the prince is you know it's a brand that 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 isn't super well known but you know is in tennis and is trying to grow from grassroots it's growing from the younger so the idea is you start playing with that that frame or that brand's frame at a young age whether it be in college or juniors, and you kind of grow up with that. I mean, you have tons of examples of players signing with racket companies because that's the racket they first played with. Osaka's with Yonex because that's what she first started with, you know, those types of examples. So I think that just shows that they're, they're serious about being in tennis and they're serious about growing in tennis and, and they're, they're getting going you know, kind of the way you have to, mm-hmm. to, to reach the, the masses and the young masses yeah. to, to get them 
you know, familiar with your brand. I mean, if you take, you know, an older player, you know, somebody who's, who's quite aged that maybe doesn't keep up with the times you ask them what the top three, you know, top five brands are, it's going to be different than somebody that's middle-aged versus somebody that's younger. You know, it's Mm -hmm. just what it was at the time you kind of started making those decisions. And then there's some of us that, you know, kind of like to, to hop around and see what's out there. But for a lot of people, it's like, well, this is the racket I played with when I started. So I just kept buying the new version every few years. And And so that's fun. And, and they're going along the same, I wouldn't say business plan, but same route as Selenko and Selenko. Yep. Show it, show it. All right. So I figured you might, we didn't even talk about this one. I figured you might go the Selenko discussion. So this is the, the new extended 28 inch. That's Um, right. So I think what what's really interesting about Selenko is the whole focus on the niche. And, you know, obviously people in tennis know them from the strings, obviously some hyper G's, you know, in this the most famous here. string that I think people people know what that string is from a mile away. Yeah. And so they came out with the white out and the blackout frames, which I love the looks of, by the way. Just the white, so- the white Classic. is clean. The yeah. white is so, so clean. And then and then they they extended on that instead of coming out with a bunch of different new lines, they've taken the white out, for example, they've done more with that than the blackout. It's a little bit heavier, more advanced version racket. And they've given us a couple different weights, but they've given us the the 18 by 20 um version. They gave us an 18 by 20, 27 and a half inch version. And then now they've given us a 28 inch version at a 16 by 19. So these are all specs that you don't normally find. Like you can go find a 16 by 19, 27 27 inch, inch. any brand, any time. Right. But to go 18 by 20, 27 and a half inch, it's just a niche. So if you have a player that's like, oh, that sounds really different. I want to try it. Well, the really one of the only spots, if not the only spot you're going to go to try that is Selenko. And they have the. I mean, they make a great string. So so they have some know-how behind them. So it's not like they're just, you know, kind of a, it's not a gimmicky thing, but they're hitting the niches because they're new to the racket frame space. They know they can't just walk out and hand you all 100 square inch, 16 by 19, 27 inch frames because everybody's doing that. So how are they going to compete in that world? Well, if you want a 28 inch length, well, where are you going to go? We'll try out Selenko. So let me ask you this, and I should probably know this, but I'm going to ask you anyways. For a 28-inch racket, what is the benefit of having a longer racket in that sense? Because if I was to break it down as a tennis coach, I feel like I have to. You have a – don't get mad at me if I get this wrong. There's 13, 15, 15. 19, 21, 23, 25, 26, and then a full-size adult racket is a 27 inches long racket. So when you go through those categories, you know exactly what you're getting. You know what type of player they are. You know what ball they're going to use, and you know the level of which they're playing. Now you're going to throw in a 28 inch. So tell us about a 28 inch because holy, part of my language, holy shit, what are we adding to this? Yeah. So, um, well, first off, there's a great article on Forbes.com that explains the whole uh, selfless plug. Please plug it. But no, to, 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 you know, let's go Michael Chang on us, right? It's Michael Chang was one of the first ones that went with the, the 28. And what you're getting is you're getting more power, especially for the height challenged player of which I fall into that category. I'm sitting now. Um, but on the serve, it gives you more leverage just, you know, physics wise. And on the ground stroke, it gives you more power. So it gives you more power, especially on the ground strokes and on the serves. And that's the main benefit. Obviously, you have a trade-off of now you have a little bit more unwieldy frame. So at the net, you know, it's going to be a little bit different than what you're used to. So it depends on, you know, if that's worth it. If you're somebody that's coming to the net all the time and, you know, enjoy, you know, kind of that, that net play up and back type stuff probably going to stick at a 27 but if you're somebody that just wants to hit a big serve and then sit back and hit a big ground stroke 
you know, the extended ranges offer more pop and okay, they really do. And so, you know, hitting with the 28, it was, it was a different feel than hitting with the 27s. And so I think that's interesting that they've got the 27, the 27 and a half, and then the, now the 28 in both the whiteout and the blackout. So, you know, there's, I, there's options I, there. Granted, I really want to try it. I really but, want to try it now. I, I like you got me so excited to try that piece of gear. <laughs> and now I have to go. If you guys don't know me, you can go shop local. I shop local all the time. The place I used to work at too. So I'm going to go find that. And I'm going to go try that out because I would love to try that out. It's definitely a unique hitting experience. And so for somebody that's really into gear and into tennis gear, that likes trying the new frames and the new strings and whatnot. It's, it's worth a, it's worth a demo at least because, because it is so, so different. I, I agree. And it's always fun trying out that new gear too. And I think the last one I think we should talk about in my chicken scratch of notes for tennis shoes, one brand that at one time I thought was going to kind of take over tennis, actually two, um, Mizuno and Diodora. Mm -hmm. Mizuno first, they are well known, and actually both brands are well known for their shoes. But Mizuno yeah. recently has been pushing it as well, not as much as Diodora, but Mizuno has come out with some interesting stuff. Can you expand upon that? Yeah, I think you know you have both brands are brands that are well known in athletics. Mm -hmm. um, Mizuno definitely a running shoe. And a baseball. I mean, they're really well yeah. known in baseball. And same with as well. swimming as well. Or am I just? You know, what I, am I, I thinking? No, I don't, uh, they no. might be. I don't know. Um, okay. Some of the other racket sports that you know, like a a racket, uh, a badminton, and things of that nature. Yes. Um, and then Diodora, obviously a running shoe, and then was well known in the cleated space. Yep. You know, more so soccer. Not you know, not. Yeah. But both have made recent pushes in tennis to to up not only just the style and the look but up the technology and the offerings and really offer a pro level experience in their footwear and i think they've both succeeded they both right now are are doing incredible stuff and and really make good shoes the mizuno they have the you know kind of that whole wave with um the now i'm going to they have like the they have the more running shoe style one, which is a super lightweight shoe. And then they have, I think it's the Enforce, which is kind of more the the a little bit more stable model. Um, and both shoes are yeah. really good. If you like the the really the exceed. light the exceed, yeah. you know, it feels like a running shoe, but it has enough stability to play tennis. I mean, it's a good quality shoe. Mm -hmm. The Enforce is definitely more um feels more like a tennis shoe. Um, that's the one that I personally prefer. But again, as we all can see, you know, I'm a little bit on the the older. I'm probably not working on the speed aspect as much as some of the some of the other people watching. Give and yourself then, credit. And then Diodora, same thing. You know, they've got the the B icon too. We talked about that. Yeah. You know, before it's a really high quality shoe. They have some crazy. Like it it looks cool too. Like Diodora yeah. to me is what Italian fashion is like for for a tennis shoe if you were to ask italian to design a tennis shoe that's what it looks like like that that to me is what it looks like as well for like mizuno with efficiency like and speed that's mizuno like that that's how distinctive i feel like their designs have been for those shoes yeah and and i think that's spot on you know i think what's fun about diodora is they have that whole italian made mm -hmm. um line and yeah, they don't have any performance shoes for tennis in that yet, but they Ooh. have some pretty awesome lifestyle, tennis lifestyle shoes yes. in there. Now, granted, you need to be able to afford to drop the, the money on that, but the leather on those are incredible. It's just a completely different feeling than than us non-luxury people are used mm -hmm. to, even when we're talking leather. You, you just don't yeah. even understand the the levels of leather quality. And so Diodora has that with, with some of their, their lifestyle offerings that are rooted in that tennis culture and heritage yeah. that they really have. And that, that they are one of the original brands in tennis yeah. too, when it came to that tennis shoe 
on court, now the off court look. And yes. you posted about, I think you posted about it to an old ad that they brought back with the Diodora shoe, correct? Yeah. Yeah. They've, like, it, it shows that. And they're definitely embracing, hey, if you want to talk heritage, we have the heritage. We, we have the record. We, yeah. Yeah. They have the receipts, you know, if we're going to go all, uh, you know, with the, the common terms. I appreciate you trying to speak the lingo of the small children. <laughs> you know, I'm um, just trying to help I, out. I don't know it, but I just throw it out there in case, you know, it helps somebody understand a little bit better. I love that. I love that. Um, wow. I think we hit everything when it comes. No, we didn't hit everything. No, but yes. we got, I got oh, sorry. Okay. Got All time. right. All right. So hold on. So hold on. Talk. Okay. Tama. All right. All right. Tama. 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 Let me, I got ahead of myself because we've been talking for over an hour. That's why I feel well, but we haven't been recording for over an hour, have we? That's true. That's very true. So <laughs> let me let me let me ask you this: the Vicor ninety seven, my fa- my tennis racket that I've been using for the last three, almost five years, actually four to five years now, is now not being replaced, but kind, but being rebranded. As hold on, are you saying you're using the, the red V core or the green V core pro? Pro V core pro 97, V core okay, pro so, 97. So, and that's that exactly right there is why we're having this discussion now because there was confusion on the V core and the V core pro are actually two completely different lines. Yes, so no more V core pro. Now you have the percept. Ex- Explain that to me because instead of doing a V-Core Pro update, they did a V-Core Pro update and rebranded the whole thing with a different name and a different paint job. Did they change anything specifically about it? Yeah, I'd have to go back and read the article to remember what it was. Another Tim Newcomb Forbes article that you can all read. But but yeah, I mean, it's it's not a completely new line. Like, we're not going to sit here and say this is like Wilson coming out with the shift where it's, it's not, a completely new line. It's yeah. an update. It'd be the equivalent to the the pro staff going from the 13 to the 14. You know, yeah. it's that kind of thing. So there's there's tweaks and there's updates. But this is the percept is the new V Core Pro. OK, and have you played with the V Core Pro? I have. Have you played with this one? I have. What's the difference? I wish I was a good enough tennis player <laughs> to be able to tell you. <laughs> but these rackets are a little. I actually enjoy the the percept uh quite a bit, but maybe I've gotten a little bit better. Okay. Um, again, I'd have to. It's been so long since I played with the V Core Pro, and okay. and I have a, a. So I coach at a local high school, and the guy I coach with, he loves the V Core Pro line, Same. and even the line and he's a much higher level player than me so he's able to to kind of get out of that what he mm-hmm. needs to you know for me i just i love the precision and the control from it mm-hmm. um my level i'm probably not going to tell a major difference between the the pro and the percept but you i'm sure will uh hopefully hopefully there's so many things that i have to try it tim is there anything that we haven't touched yet i'm sure there's a lot of things we haven't touched but you know, I don't know how how long you want to go because uh, we're we're kind of hitting the time <laughs> limits here. I, I'm pretty sure on, uh, especially you know, people's patience watching us. Oh, absolutely! I appreciate everyone that's still watching us. Um, Tim's going to show off his new CG one Coco Golf spooky under- season for spooky season. For- yep another season. another um, another yeah. new term that Tim uses to get in touch with the kids. Just hold, uh, hold it. Wait, difficult. hold it. Hold it right there for the thumbnail. Hold it. Nope. The other way. So that way we can see the whole shoe. Yep. Like that. Y- yeah. And you can smile <laughs> there. That's our, that's our thumbnail right there. Um, but I, I appreciate everyone that's been watching. Please subscribe. Definitely subscribe. Um, we talked about Mizuno. We talked about Diodora. Is there any, I know you just recently released an, Forbes article about Swing Vision, a brand that yeah. I am proud to call one of my sponsors and to be a brand ambassador for. I absolutely, I, I tell you guys all the time, please try it. Um, you can check the link in the description for a free trial. 
um, and get a discount if you decide to buy the full pro version. Um, but definitely click that link. What Lindsay Davenport just invested. They just went their another series of funding. Andy Roddick is one of the original investors. James Blake is one of the original investors. What this technology is fantastic to me. Is there is there any other technology like it for you to talk about that's kind of revolutionizing tennis? You know, I think what's going to be different about this than some of the the just the tracking, like when when they first started, when Supino first started Swing Vision, he kind of envisioned it as the Strava of tennis, where yeah. for those that don't know Strava, you go for a run or or bike ride or something, and it, it maps your metrics, right? You know, how yeah. long did you go? Some of that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's it's kind of a fun tool when you get done your run. You're like, okay, I was a little bit faster or slower or whatnot on this section. Yeah. and for to have that for tennis, you know, it's kind of a recreational fun, but there's not a lot of places you can go with that. It's just mm -hmm. something to have. So yeah. it may be a little bit harder to monetize. Where I think the big push that they've got going now, as you well know, is the line calling mm -hmm. and, and how AI. that works for all the junior tournaments and even hopefully college. You know, a big issue, obviously, anywhere you have somebody calling their own lines, and we all know we've, you know, we're all coaching there or playing there, you know it doesn't always work out well. Oh, yeah. And so having that option along with the streaming, you know, cause you know, like I was talking to Lindsay Davenport and, and I find the same with my kids. I have three daughters that, that all play various sports and, you know, they go to an AAU basketball tournament and I can spend money and watch and stream that whole tournament, every tournament, basically no matter where. And Lindsay Davenport was saying the same thing with her daughters who play volleyball, but tennis isn't really that same thing. There's not, places streaming each court very few tournaments offer streaming so that's the two things that really set this one apart is yes you still have that data okay the forehand was this the backhand was this and and get your their coaching points but then you also have the ability to stream live matches and then that the live you know in Portion. tournament line calling um is kind of where they see this really taking off I, and i love it for for sure and what they're doing is fantastic Plus the challenging on the Apple watch, just the way they're yeah. using different parts of technology to bring the best out of a player or a coach. And I say this all the time too. I've talked to my boss about it because his kid plays high level tournaments, like even just training or doing a practice match and just watching it back. Yeah. The features that it has just, just another level of tennis training and tennis streaming for that matter because um play site was the original when it first yep. came out and then it it was expensive and it's expensive to install something like that of of not mass production but of a uh, volume like you can't yeah. afford to put it on every court at a club you can maybe do two or three maybe just one but then you want everyone using it and then it's hogged by one group or one training session so it's hard to replicate that where now technology has gone so far to now be at everyone's fingertips where you can do it yourself for those that don't know swing vision you do on your iphone or your ipad so you can personally have it where where these other ones you had to have entire systems and a and a tournament could buy you know say they have eight courts or whatnot they could buy eight ipads and set them up at each court mm-hmm and and you can see a lot of them doing that at tournaments as well. I've already seen it at a couple regional tournaments for the ITA where they're looking back and using iPads to record their matches. Um, Tim, I think we've hit our time limit, <laughs> yeah. I would like to say. Uh, we could go on and on and on, but we just appreciate you coming back to talk about the other brands and getting a full scale kind of recap of all the most... I would say most, not all, but most technology and gear that's come out this year. Please check out Tim's uh, Forbes articles down in the description below. Go check out Tim on Twitter. Um, go follow Felt and Alley Tennis on Instagram. Correct? Felt and Alley. Yeah. Uh, just Felt Alley Tennis. I was Felt Alley Tennis on Instagram. Get into a thousand followers. Let's go help him out. Thank you again, Tim, for joining us. Please subscribe to the channel. We're trying to get 5,000 subs by the end of the year. And again, Tim, it's always a pleasure having you on. I appreciate it. And I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you guys so much.